Okay, so what is political theology? These are sort of two figures that are um, kind of historical bookends uh, in shaping the field that's known as political theology. Political theology, this is just a textbook definition of it right here. It's a branch of political philosophy that investigates the ways in which religious concepts or ways of thinking underlie political, social, economic, and cultural discourses and institutions. Chances are you haven't come across this term before. Um, in, in some sort of places, it, it's an important part of political sciences departments. But more often than not, it's kind of left out. Uh, but again, so in recent years, more and more people have been paying attention to this notion of political theology because people are, are rethinking the relationship, the proper relationship between religion and politics. And therefore, this kind of question about the role that religious beliefs and convictions and communities play in shaping electoral politics becomes more and more uh, prominent uh, within the analysis of political philosophy. This quote right here is from this figure, Carl Schmitt. Um, and, it's, and it's all significant concepts of the state are secularized theological concepts. A lot of big words there. Uh, this is from his major work on political theology entitled Political Theology. Uh, so the, the, the notion here is that even though we, we believe that our, our so the political discourse and our political institutions have severed ties with uh, religious beliefs and religious traditions and religious communities, his argument was if you really sort of look underneath the surface, in some ways they're derived from uh, religious attitudes. And that there's a remnant of kind of lingering religiosity that's at work, even within our secular political institutions. And so it, it, the, the notion of political theology was, how can we kind of interrogate the, the lingering religiosity that still exists within our political uh, sort of beliefs, actions, and institutions? So this is uh, kind of opening orientation for what is political theology. I said that sort of these two figures are the historical bookends. So let me begin with a snapshot view of the modern history of political theology by pointing to the outer historical parameters in the person of Baruch Spinoza and Carl Schmitt. Spinoza's on top, Carl Schmitt's on bottom. Spinoza and Schmitt represent not only the historical bookends, but also opposite ends of the political theological spectrum. Modern political theology begins with Spinoza's theological political treatise from 1670 which inaugurates an eminent political theology that corresponds to a burgeoning democratic age. If you don't know Spinoza, then shame on you, you should. Um, he's one of the great philosophical minds of the Western world. And let me just kind of introduce him a little bit for you so you can recognize uh, what a kind of towering figure he is in shaping uh, modern philosophical thought, the enlightenment, and also attitudes about kind of religion and politics. Spinoza's theological political treatise was regarded by his contemporaries as, quote, subversive, blasphemous, and even diabolical, but since has been called pioneering and a neglected masterpiece. It is credited not only for beginning the tradition of higher criticism of the Bible, but also for laying out the frame for the modern secular state. He is credited for his thoroughgoing naturalistic critique of the Bible, and as the forerunner to the scientific study of religion in general. He was committed to the effort at constructing a religiously neutral approach to biblical interpretation for the purposes of overcoming religious conflict. Think about when he's writing, 1670. This is on the heels of a period of, of religious warfare in Western Europe that breaks out after the Protestant Reformation. And these Catholics are killing Protestants, Protestants are killing Catholics, and Protestants are killing Protestants basically, because it's conflict of, of authority, of religious authority. Uh, Catholics say the Pope is the final authority. Protestants say the Bible is the final authority. No two Protestants can agree on what the Bible actually says. So the only way to resolve that kind of conflict is by killing each other, basically. This is the kind of political environment that he's writing in, and the reason why he's concerned with these kinds of issues. But while the bulk of this treatise is more concerned with religious interpretation than political analysis, its primary intent, and what distinguishes Spinoza from other biblical critics from this period, as he makes clear in the preface, is his passionate and unequivocal defense 
of the liberal freedoms a modern democratic society affords its citizens as persons of free conscience. Quote, now since we have the rare good fortune to live in a commonwealth where freedom of judgment is fully granted to the individual citizen, and he may worship God as he pleases, and where nothing is esteemed dearer or more precious than freedom, I think I am undertaking no ungrateful or unprofitable task in demonstrating that not only can this freedom be granted without endangering piety and the peace of the commonwealth, but also the peace and co of the commonwealth and piety depend on this freedom. So he's making an argument for kind of democratic freedoms and sort of a peace of a multi-religious society that's all predicated on this form of religious critique. It's only by crit critiquing religious authority and doctrinaire religious thinking that one can really create the necessary cultural conditions for a democratic society. This is the argument that he lays out in his political theological freedom. In short, for Spinoza, superstition, religious superstition, dogmatism, doctrinaire thinking, religious authoritarianism, these are all incompatible with a truly free society. The task of his religious analysis, therefore, is to deliver humankind from its ill-founded superstitions and to expose the mystery of despotism to the light of reason. In this way, he divests the sovereign of divine authorization and makes the case for a popular sovereignty, wherein authority is vested in all the citizens and laws are sanctioned by common assent. As one scholar puts it, quote, Spinoza's fundamental aim is to replace the reigning theocratic conception of the state with one founded on secular principles, end quote. And as another scholar puts it, quote, it is Spinoza and Spinozism which promotes the adoption of secular reason in government, universal toleration, and shared equity among all men, personal liberty, freedom of expression, and democratic republicanism. So this is Spinoza. Not a bad legacy at all. Modern political theology, current preoccupations, however, have largely been determined not by Spinoza, but by Carl Schmitt. He's a 20th century German political philosopher, Carl Schmitt. Specifically, his book, Political Theology, which was first published in 1922 and later revived and republished in 1934. Schmitt works, works, Schmitt's work arrives into the historical scene at precisely that crisis point when there is the unmistakable realization for many of the breakdown of the modern liberal democratic order. Think here of what you know about Germany during this time. It has been defeated in World War I. Its government at this time, which is known as the Weimar Republic, has been required to pay the massive war debts that had been accumulated by the great European powers. Its economy is spiraling out of control it's facing the problem of hyperinflation, widespread unemployment, and a burgeoning frustration and disaffection by its population that is easily translated into a populist fascist movement by which Adolf Hitler comes to power. Schmidt fits into this historical, political, cultural, and economic matrix by offering up his political theology as a kind of theoretical remedy. He eventually comes to be known as Hitler's, quote, crown jurist. In other words, he's an insider and opportunist within Hitler's Nazi regime. It is in this context that his political theology must be read and understood. As such, it is easy to see how his work is a complete repudiation and reversal of Spinoza's political theology. So four points on this. First, whereas Spinoza heralds the beginning of the modern liberal democratic order. Schmidt chronicles or exposes or perhaps even hastens its end. Number two, whereas Spinoza's theology functions as a political propedeutic by using his critique of religious authority to create an open and free space for democratic reasoning, Schmidt begins with modern political philosophy and lays bare its theological root. All significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts, he writes. By this assertion, Smith is calling for a return to a more traditionalist theological understanding wherein the legitimacy of political power is based upon a unified and coherent religious worldview. A return to an age of Christendom, 
wherein sovereign political power has its analog in and is derived from its vision of God as a sovereign and transcendent authority. In short, for Schmidt, political theology and modern liberal democracy are mutually exclusive and radically opposed. Schmidt is unapologetically anti-democratic. Number three, whereas Spinoza is the prototypical secular theologian whose imminent critique of religion, like Karl Marx's centuries later, was the beginning of a much broader political program and democratic revolution, Schmidt draws on a classical theological image of the transcendent God as a rationale for his critique of the contradictions and emptiness of modern democracy. And number four, finally, whereas Spinoza was almost the prototypical iconoclast, leaving him an outsider twice removed, as one scholar puts it, to the Jewish community, he was declared officially a heretic who was excommunicated at age 24, and to the Christian community, he was still regarded as an atheist Jew, regarded by his contemporaries as, quote, the most impious and most dangerous man of the century, end quote. Schmidt followed his powerful critiques of the foundation of the Weimar Republic by becoming a supporter of Adolf Hitler and a member of the Nazi party. So Spinoza, the classic outsider, Schmidt, the classic insider. The point of this brief snapshot is a simple one. At present, it's not Spinoza, but Schmidt, along with his anti-democratic thrust and bias that cast a long shadow over the entire field of contemporary political theology. It is my argument that Schmidt, and more specifically, his employment of political theology in opposition to democratic theory and practice, that is the chief obstacle to political theology realizing its own radically democratic potential. My argument is that by Schmidt's conflation of democracy with modern liberalism, Schmidt effectively throws the baby out with the bathwater. While political theology might get its impetus from the despair over the perceived failures of modern liberalism, it need not and must not be allowed to translate into a rejection of democracy as such. This is Schmidt's great mistake, which is one that gets reduplicated each time the assumption is made that democracy and political theology are fundamentally and necessarily incompatible. The alternative I'm proposing, and which I propose in my book here, is a democratic political theology. It is a democratic political theology that is both, both post-liberal and post-secular. And as a democratic political theology, it is to be understood as a necessary supplement to radical democratic theory's own efforts at rethinking the conceptual basis of democracy itself. What this means in a very concrete sense, which will become the basis and bulk of my presentation here today, is that we need to rethink the proper relationship between religion and politics. The old, modern, liberal, secular norm will no longer do. So that, we can sort of move on to the topic at hand. What is post-secularism? Or what is the post-secular? A brief word is required for my use of these terms secular and post-secular. Let me be clear, this is oftentimes confused. The term secular should not, underlying should not, be understood as the opposite of religion or the absence of religion. After all, constitutionally speaking, the United States is a secular nation. There's no mention of God in the Constitution, and religion is only mentioned twice. Once when the Constitution forbids any religious test or oath for political office, and second in the First Amendment, where the government is explicitly prohibited from making any law respecting an establishment of religion and from impeding the free exercise of religion. If we are secular by law, we also happen to be among the most religious nations in all of the industrialized world. So we are both secular and religious at one and the same time, without contradiction. As one religion scholar puts it, we're secular by law and religious by choice. If the term secular does not mean the op opposite or absence of religion, then what does it mean? Most often, it has been taken to mean the separation of church and state. While I myself certainly support this aspect of our cultural and political heritage, and would point out the paradox that it is precisely by virtue of the separation of church and state 
that religion life, religious life in the United States has thrived and remained vibrant throughout our history. That is to say, precisely because we regard religion as voluntary here in the United States, it has remained relevant. 